Our Father and our God, we confess that we are entering into a realm of your character that is unfathomable to us. But with the help of your word and the presence of the blessed Holy Spirit who inspired it in the first place, we trust that we can come to an understanding somewhat of your immutability. And we trust that it may cause us to humble ourselves, it may cause us to recognize that you are God over all, blessed forever, and worship you accordingly. Grant help now to your servant because he is weak, but we are thankful that you are strong. Amen. Prove yourself mighty to us again today as your word is open. In the precious name of our Savior, amen. amen. The last two portions we have regarding this thank you, precious topic on the doctrine of God. First, it started with the life of Job and how God showed himself mightily and working himself behind the scenes in the life of Job and to the point in which Job had to reach to recognize who he is and who indeed God was and is. And then last week we looked at his aseity, his self-existence and his sovereignty. And I know they sound as if they're like heavy words. And as I said last week, we wanted it not to be academic, where it's just definition of words, but as they're explained, and we get an understanding as to what they mean and what they are, how it should cause an adjustment in our lives. I know most of us here, if not all of us here, are good variants. You would have taken what you've heard last week, and you would have gone home and searched, I would come back today with some fresh gleanings, right? So, sister, sis, I know you're a good writer of things you would hear. So, can you, for a minute, just tell me what we spoke on last week with regards to a safety and his sovereignty? Um, so, we looked, at, we looked at Job's life, and we And then we look at God Himself being self existing, self all existing one, and that He's in control. <laughs> the key point is that He's in control of everything. Amen. There is nothing outside of His realm that He can do anything. So, Job was brought to that point when he realized that God is all self existing. Well yes, someone else, a brother, brother, brother Moody, brother Moody, D.L. Moody. Um, yeah, I could, I, the essential thing God who is a self existent one does not depend on anything or anyone to exist. Um, he is who he is, and um, I, we look in Job, and I think we look in some other portion of scriptures, I can't remember the portion of scripture that I read last week, but it's just that God is self-existent. He doesn't need anything out of himself to exist. All right, amen. Well done. And we call some of those things his non-communicable attributes, meaning that they're exclusive to God. We're going to look at one of them again today, his immutability, and I just want to thank Garrett for putting this uh, thing together so that it could be a little bit more, um, you can see and sort of understand where the scripture, because today is going to really be about the word of God. Just, just forget my voice for a minute and just as we go into the scriptures, where it would highlight this tremendous attribute of God, that of his immutability. And the first uh, portion we want to look at is in Malachi chapter 3. So if we could just turn to Malachi chapter 3, I think Garrett has it up here. <laughs> All right. 
says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And the other one we have. And so it's James 1 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And the last one, as we just do the introduction, is Hebrews 13 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So as you see the topic of his immutability, we are seeing the never-changing aspect of the character of God, that he doesn't change, that he cannot change, that even though he's called the ancient of days, he doesn't have a mutation, he doesn't have memory lapses, he cannot change. He is who he is. And the text in Malachi chapter 3, I think is so important. Why? Because I believe it is strategically placed right there at the end of the Old Testament. Because what we are having now, we are having the end of the Old Covenant. We are having the end of the Old Testament. We are entering into new things, into the New Testament, where God is preparing the earth for the arrival of his son. And there was silence from heaven for 400 years. 400 years. And in all of this, God remained the same. And so the prophet Malachi is saying, I am the Lord. I do not change. And so as the earth is about to usher in its Messiah, as the earth is about to usher in the one who will fulfill in his person the offerings, the feast, the old sacrificial system, and the law, that the Lord Jesus in his person would fulfill all of these things. That's what he came to do. He fulfilled the law in his person and the, the, the feast will speak of himself. He fulfilled it all. And so Malachi prophesied that God doesn't change. So in, in, amidst all of this change that is about to come, heaven is saying, don't worry. We have a God that doesn't change. Dear saints, let me say this. As I got up here just even now to sing the song, I'm going to tell you something. I forgot the lyrics. I wrote that song and I went up there. So I know you saw me stringing the guitar trying to catch my thoughts back together. And as I'm there, I'm saying, oh my God, I'm suffering mutation here. But that's what happened to us, right? As we get older, we forget things. As we get older, things that we used to do, we can't do them no more. Because we don't have the strength, we don't have the ability as we had 10, 15, 20 years ago. We change. We have mutations. But consider God who's been around forever. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And he doesn't change. Now to me, that is a great comfort. Because consider this, what if he was to change? Consider that for a moment. What if God was to change on his promises? What if he was to change on the things that he said he will do? What if he was to change on the promise that he said, Christ said that he will come back again? What if he said that this is contingent upon my behavior? What if all these things is conditional on who we are and what we do? Can you imagine that? Because we know who we are. That even though we are saved and positionally, God sees us as, as perfect creatures because he's seen us in the person of his son, Christ. But what if he was to say, well, you know, look at what he did today. And sin cannot glory in my presence. I'm what if he was to be that? So his immutability is so important that he doesn't change. That he's from everlasting to everlasting. And so when time began, he was already in existence. And that is what's precious about this subject. It's very humbling because we suffer mutations. And we're going to look at the, even the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is human nature and his divine nature. Because his human nature had mutations, right? Because Luke chapter 2 tells us that he grew in strength and wisdom and was in favor with God and man. 
God doesn't grow. He's constant. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never, ever forget that. And we're going to get into some things that you probably hadn't probably heard before, but probably just open up your understanding a little bit because you're coming from the Word of God. We want to be Word students today, Word merchants today. That's the topic for today. We want to get back to the Bible and save ourselves from our own understanding. Lean not to thy own understanding, the Word of God says, right? Get it from the Word of God. So his immutability is the changeless character of God. So as we see, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to look at some of the, uh, some other aspects of his of his character that are changeless, of him being unchanging. The first one, Gareth, if you could just move on, as uh, he's unchanging in his essence. And essence is really who he is, all of his person. There's no part of him that suffers mutation. There's no part of God that is different from the other part. In other words, his grace is not different from his justice or his mercy is a little bit lower than he is the same. He is the same in every aspect of it. And so as we go to the Exodus verse, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, Moses is being prepared to go to Pharaoh. Right? And God said to him, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses asked, what shall I say? Who shall I say send me? And he used the name that contains all of who he is. He said, tell him, I am sent you. Because he said, I am that I am. What am means? You can't become anything. We are becoming. God is pure being. He is pure being. He hasn't become anything. And he will never become anything. Because he is the same. Yes, today today and forever. We change. We become things, right? As we grow, we become a teacher, a lawyer. In the city. We change and we have these kind of things as we grow. God is constant. And so Moses was told, tell him, I am sent you. I imagine Pharaoh hearing that. I am. What is that? What is the awesome name of God? Yahweh. The awesome, holy, never changing aspect and name of God. You know, and as we looked at last week, that God uses names in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, when it comes to various aspects of what he would do. And we saw it in uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Rapha, all the various different names. And he said, well, what, what, this is just, God just wants us to know names. No, what is telling us things about who he is? And he's the same in all of them. Doesn't have a little bit here or put a little bit more. This other thing that I hear all the time, that our praise is going to make God more perfect. First of all, that's, that's not a good English idiom, right? More perfect. Because once you're perfect, you can't get more. I can't get most. Perfect is your perfect. You can't go above that. So our praise, our worship is not going to make him greater than he is. Never. And as we looked at last week, that he desires our worship. He desires our praise. He doesn't need it, but he desires it. <coughs> he desires it. So, and then the, there's another verse with regard to Psalms 90 verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, Everlasting. You are God. He didn't become God. From everlasting to everlasting, there's no becoming in him. From, the, from eternity past, he is who he is. That should be of so much comfort to us. God just didn't become God when we got saved. He was always God. He was always God. Pre-creation. He is who he is. So he's unchanging in his essence. Do we change? And I hope that we do for the better. Because that's what the, the scripture says, right? Let this mind be in you which was in Christ. So when we have renewed mind, we're not going to be the same, right? The things we do, we do them no more. The place we go, we go them no more. Because we have mutations. We change from one aspect to another. 
And the word of God, he tells us what Christ has done for us. He says that he who has begun a work will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. And so as we live, God is working behind the scenes to mold us even for the better into who he wants us to be. But God is unchanging in his essence. The next one. He is unchanging in his love. I am so glad for this one. Let me tell you. Because let me say this. Dear saints, there are a lot of married couples here. And I trust that it's based on love. But there are many marriages that are conditional, right? They're based upon, okay, I'll marry him. Because I think I could have a good future with him. He's doing a good job. And vice versa. In a good situation, my kids would be fine. I, even when I was in Jamaica, I used to hear people say, well, I want to marry a man with a, with a straight ear because my kids will have straight ear. <laughs> it used to be the condition for marriage. I'm telling you. I'm not going to marry someone too dark because I, I don't want my child to come out like a tar-looking kid. We hear that all the time. But God's love is not conditional. And it's unchanging. And so the verses, Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord have appeared of all unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore the love and kindness have I joined you. Let me say this. It's not that God loves you today and tomorrow you do something bad and it's not change. That's how we love. Right? Sometimes, you know, we love, and as I said, it's conditional based. It changes based on what you expect of the person. God's love is everlasting. It doesn't have change. It doesn't have anything that can go higher or lower. And he proved it in so many ways, too. We sung the hymns this morning, the greatness of his love. But dear saints, he has loved us with an everlasting love. It doesn't change. Isn't that awesome? I don't hear you here. Isn't that awesome? With an everlasting love. It doesn't love us just today. We get up this morning and say, I'm going to have my devotions. God loves me. No. He loves us in our weaknesses, in our strengths. He loves us in the morning. We go to bed at nights. We pray to, her, to him and we put our kids to bed. His love is the same today. It's the same today. It's the next verse. It says, Therefore, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that this hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world. How did he love them? No, so he had some challenges with a few of the rest of the disciples, right? He had to say to Peter, he called Peter, get thee behind me. Who? Oh. And what did Peter do? He denied it how many times? And Peter swore on it too, you know. We talk about swearing in our um in our Bible study. Peter swear. I didn't know that man. I've never been, I've never heard of him. You think that Christ's love for Peter changed based on his betrayal of him? Let me say something also about the love of God. And in this case, the love of Christ. When Judas this, this is a touchstone moment in the entire scripture, I believe. The one who is selling him out. And he went up to him and gave him a kiss. You know what Jesus said to him? What did he say? He said, friend. Friend, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss. He loved us with an everlasting love. And it's not conditional. And this should be of encouragement to us. The way we love. Whether it's our family or kids. Well, whatever we do, whatever we show love. And how did he, he tells us how we show love. Uh, Romans 5, 8. But God commends his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died. So we say we love all the time too, you know. We love. But he showed his love in the greatest of ways. And not just on the just, you know. Because the rain just don't fall on the just house. The just and the unjust. He's a God of everlasting love. It's not diminished. It's not conditional. That should be a great encouragement. I think there's one more verse on that. First John 4. And he cannot help but love because of this. He says, He that loveth God, who loveth not, knoweth not God. Why? That's who he is. 
is the personification of love. That's so good. Dear saints, and he loves us with that kind of love. Don't you feel that every day, though? Let me say this. You get up in the morning, you go to that shower, you jump in your car, and you go to work. You take it. We probably take these things for granted because it kind of comes easy and it's routine. But the fact that we get up clothed in our right minds and go to work is because of his love. It's because of his love, dear saints. And as I said, he used to say, I have slim feet and slim knees, but they should be bruised every morning thanking him. I make it a point of duty that when I pray, the three things I thank him for is love, his goodness, and his mercy. Because they are they endure forever. They're not conditioned. I know how filthy I can be, and I am in myself. What if his love for me was conditioned based on the way I live my life? My goodness. What a God. What an awesome God we have. Whose love is never changing. So the, and then finally, so quite a few verses. We know this, so we can paraphrase a little bit. And the reason why I kind of chose this verse is because of what the Greek word for porno is. You can probably look up. It's called prognosto, the Greek word. And it means love for it's forever, from in the past. What a love that he has for his for us. That he loved us even before we were born. You talk about love, we see people and we love. He loved us from even before we were born. He chose us from before we were born. You want to know love? Look on this verse. Look on this verse. And you know what? It never changed. It never changed. It's really a humbling thing, I tell you. Sometimes I'm here and I'm trembling right now. Because of the never-changing aspect of all these attributes of God. Both his communicable ones and his non-communicable ones. They are great dear ones. We have an awesome God. We have a magnificent God who showered us with these things every day. So we saw that he doesn't change in his essence. Neither is love. The second thing. His word doesn't change. Satan tried it. I mean, that's what he did, you know. In the garden, said to Eve, that's not what God said. Did God really say that? That's how we plunge the world into sin. Because he created that doubt in Eve's head, in Eve's mind. He said, God didn't say that. I mind you, if God said that, that's not what he meant. But God's word, he honors his word above everything. Doesn't change. Scriptures. The grass withereth. Isaiah 40. I hope you're taking these down. And I said you could go home again and go over the grass withereth. The flower faded. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Sometimes our word don't really mean nothing. Now. Isn't that so? We make these promises. I give you my word. That's our sort of favorite thing of ours. Trust me. I give you my word. By the time we leave the door, that, that change. His hands forever. And we can take confidence in that because what that means, therefore, is that what God has promised in his word, that it won't change. That no matter what happens, his word will stand sure forever. And that is a great encouragement to your saints. The next thing. Heaven and earth shall pass. By the way, you know, these things about this aspect of God, there's so many of them in scriptures. You go over them, you can, and that's why I think this, this attribute of God is immutability is so important because there are literally hundreds of verses that you can go to or alluded to with this aspect of his car. That says to me that God wants us to know about this aspect of who he is. He's never changed. So his word will not pass away. His word is sweet. You go to Psalms 19, and it tells us about his word. Sweeter than the honeycomb. Sweeter than the honeycomb. And I tell you, Jeremiah said, I hate them. But they were sweet to my taste. They were the joy and the rejoicing of my I tell you what, I'm falling all in love over and over again with the word of God. And you know, even though sometimes the word of God indicts me, but also, it exposes or it shows the greatness, the magnanimity of 
his love, of his goodness and his grace. And it's wonderful news. His word doesn't change. You can trust it. That's what it means. You can trust what he says. His word is inerrant. There's veracity of scripture. It doesn't change. All may change. But Jesus name, but glory to his name. Yeah. Say amen. amen. Yes. Psalm 119. Forever. Oh God. That word is settled where? In heaven. His word is settled in heaven. Where is our home? We're just passing through here. Where his word is settled. So his essence doesn't change. His word doesn't change. His love doesn't change. The next one he has. His purposes. And this one is of tremendous encouragement. God's purposes, his counsels, they do not change. Let's go to the verses. As I said, remember the former things of old. For I am God. And there is no one else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Brother Zach's verse. And from ancient times. The things that are not yet done. Saying. My counsel shall stand. And I will do all. My pleasure. Nothing. Will thwart. The purpose. Of God. I don't hear you here. Amen. Nothing. Nothing. You talk about what can come in front of God's love. We saw the verse. What shall separate us from the love of God? And Paul lists a lot of things that probably would separate our love from our loved ones. Death, all these things. Things on earth, on earth. Nothing. His purposes will stand. My counsel shall stand. And it says, for my pleasure. That's why they cannot change. <coughs> It's not contingent on anything but his pleasure. And when he saved us, Ephesians 1 said what? To do what? To the praise of his glory. Oh, wow. To the praise of his glory. His glory. Praise of his glory. Let us never ever forget that. And worship him. And love him so. Next verse it says. Next, he said his mind doesn't change. I didn't put any scriptures there for that because this is the one that I say that tend to have that kind of controversial tint to it, but there's no controversy. God doesn't change his mind. We say, Brother Rich, what about those scriptures that talks about God relenting or God repenting? Genesis 6 6, for example, when he said, Okay, the earth. That I made, and I said it was good. Everything I made was good, but there's evil continually. And I said that it repented of God that he made man. Jonah chapter 3, we see where God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Because I'm going to destroy the city. But because they repented, he said God relented of the judgment he was going to give us. Exodus 32, we see where Moses petitioned the people on behalf of of Israel, which is on God, sorry, on behalf of Israel, when they were worshipping the calf. And God said, I was going to destroy them, but because of Moses' prior and intercession, it says that God relented of the judgment he was going to do. So then how come we say God doesn't change his mind? Hmm? And it sounds as if the Bible is contradicting himself, itself. But here it is. And Brother Doc spoke on this already too. There are things that God use and does to get to us on a human level. We talk about it last week about the anthropomorphic language of God. We talked about the right hand of God to demonstrate his power. Or he owns a cattle and a thousand hill to show his immense and vast riches and all these things. But you go to the didactic portion of Numbers chapter 23. You know what that verse says? That God is not a man that he should lie. That he is not the son of man who should repent. So you have the narrative that tells you these things about God, that he relents and changes his mind and all those kind of things. But the didactic portion of scripture will tell you that he's 
A man who doesn't and cannot do that. You ask me, can fire change the mind of God? To ask such a question is to answer. How can fire really change the mind of God? It cannot. Oh, that sounds a little heretical there. Well, let me tell you this. Do I believe that prayer changes things? Absolutely. Is the fervent, righteous prayer of the righteous availeth much? Absolutely. The one thing it does is change the mind of God. He is the same. He knows everything. He instructs us. God doesn't have a plan B. It's not that we, uh, we pray to God and say, God, I, I, you, I know you are thinking to do this, but can you consider this? He doesn't have a plan B. He doesn't go to the line and the coach change the play and call an audible. God doesn't do that. Because it would destroy the other things that we talk about him with regards to his nature. His mind doesn't change. So he said, well, why do we pray? And the simple answer to that is because he asks us to. That's a simple answer. Do you think God knows the answer? Because we have it here in the verse, right? He knows the what from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. So how our prayer is going to change his mind? Can I? Can I? He asks us to do these things. And it changes things, as I said, but not his mind. I want us to close off with four things about his immutability that I want us to take a look at. What men hate most about God? Not Christians, but men in general. What do they hate most about God? holiness. And he's been holy from eternity past. I was listening the other day and there's a story about 30 students in a class, right? And the teacher gave them a test, an exam. And 29 of the students got between 59 to 70 percent. And everyone there is struggling because it's the test that will make sure that they go to the next phase. So what the teacher did was what? You students, you should know this. The teacher would grade on a curve, right? Yes. But then there's one student out of a, like a Jada Brown, for example. She's a very smart girl. And she gets 98. And then everybody in the class stood up and said, Whoa, congratulations. No! They hate her! Because she broke the curve. Who was looked upon as the paragon of virtue in the time of Christ? The Pharisees and the scribes. But they were phonies, they were counterfeit. Their hypocrisy was called out by Christ. And their hypocrisy was exposed when the genuine showed up. And so when they saw Christ, they hated him because he was different from them. He was holy. And they hate holiness. And you know, they said from that moment, from, do you know that from the moment Christ was born, the desire was to kill him? Because the angel said that the holy thing that would conceive Son of the highest. He's holds holy from birth, and that's what they hate about Christ. They hate his holiness. Second thing they don't hate is his omniscience. And it started with Adam and Eve. Because when they sinned, what did they do? Probably God won't find me. I'm gonna hide myself. Like God doesn't know all things. So they thought when God said, Adam, where art thou? He was asking for location. He wasn't. He knew where they were. Because he knows all things. And sometimes when we do our little bad deeds, we do them in the dark. Because we think he doesn't know. 
or he may forget, or he may suffer mutation. So we hate that about God. Why can't he be like me and forget things? And so when the scripture said that God forgets our sins, it's not forget in the sense that he forgets them. It's that he's not holding them against us anymore. That's what it means. So we hate his holiness. We hate his omniscience. The other thing we hate is his omnipotence. He has all the power. What the scripture says, that the kings of the earth do what? The kings of the earth do what? They fight against God and then he sits in the heaven and does what? Laugh at them and holds them in derision. And they're like, well, I can't do anything to get to this mighty. Of course you can. Well, you know, Satan is going to try that in Revelations uh, 18, I think, with the armies of the earth. You're going to be defeated. You're going to be defeated. You're going to fight against God. Good luck, guys. Good luck. He has all power. We do not. Trump may think he does, but he doesn't. No. God has all power. And the final thing that men hate about God is his immutability. That it doesn't change. What happened to us? Huh? When we get old, dear saints, we start to have senior moments. Yes, we forget things. First, it's the Alzheimer's, or all these things that happen to us physically because we age. We go to hospital. The medical field is a growth industry today, right? Why? Because we have mutations. We change. Things happen to us physically. And he stays the same. He's on this level. Not the earth. He's immune. Doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Boy, that is a humbling thing, isn't it? Every morning, when you get up, or when I get up, if I see the sun and I don't see the sun, and we say, I, I go to work sometimes. So I'm like, what a lousy day. Rain all day. Lousy and so cold and snow. We get snow in the winter and, and, and in summer. We get sun and it's hot and, and it's cold and all these things that in our realm that is subject to change. The season change. The time change. Your bodies change. Even the houses that we live in. In the winter you see the, the stripping of the walls because everything changed. Everything. Yet the one who doesn't change, we have him inside of us. I'm not hearing you here. The one who doesn't change is inside of us. So therefore, let me ask you, if God is for us, hallelujah. That's who we have in this aspect of his beauty. change. And it's not subject to change. Circumstances won't change him. And so when we come, if it's the two or the three, he is here. If it's a million, he is there because we're gathered to his name. He doesn't change. And I say this and sit down. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, he must forsook him. He did, right? Alexander the Coppersmith gone great. It's up towards him. Titus, who had just thought about Jesus Christ, he gone somewhere else. He said, all oh, forsook me. Because they change. Once they were faithful, they used to go. Luke went all over it. We placed with him. Timothy. They were there, but at my need, the moment of need, they changed. They left. He must love the present world. Copper Smith gone somewhere else. But nevertheless, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. It doesn't change. Because what was his promise? That he will never leave us or forsake us. I'm not hearing you here. Amen. Amen. It doesn't leave us, dear saints.
glory of God. All of all his attributes. So we know God is a safety, his sovereignty, his eternality. But this one here, man, very humbling. Let us bruise our knees as we recognize that we have an awesome, wonderful God who loves us with an unchanging love. His essence doesn't change, whose word doesn't change, and who is he? We trust that we live accordingly in that light for his honor, for his glory. And it is so for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.